If you're an adult amateur horse lover who wonders what it takes to make magic with horses, you're in the right place. I'm Paige Lockton, and this is The Magic of Horsecraft. Join me for conversations with wizards in the world of horsecraft about the ingredients needed to build connection with horses and courage in life. Turns out these things are connected. How do I know? <laughs> like most things, I learned the hard way. I lost the magic I once had with horses. In regaining it, I discovered that the elements of connection are learnable. Whether you ride your horses forwards, backwards, or sideways, stick around for stories that show us how we are the same and that anything is possible. Take a chance. Welcome, and thank you for joining me for a conversation with Tick Maynard. I'll tell you more about Tick Maynard as we go along, but I'm going to start with a story of how I met him. Recently, I was on a pilgrimage across Canada and the U.S. in my little green Volkswagen bug, I call her Mabel, <laughs> in search of the magic of horsecraft and life. I had stayed with friends along the way and uh, had worked my way down to Florida. And I was staying with my friend Nicole Parkin, who needed a helping hand at a competition. There was a horse trial at Rocking Horse Farms in Altoona, Florida. And I spent a couple of days helping her with three young horses that she's bringing along. And at the end of the second day, she was in first place. She loaded up her horses, winner, winner, chicken dinner. She was on the road. And I thought, I'm going to just stay and watch and uh, see how the sport has evolved and get to know competitors in the sport that I've lost track of because I left the sport to raise babies and work in the energy field and do other things for quite a period of time. So I went out on course and positioned myself at a combination of fences that had to be taken very accurately. And um, somebody came through that was just smooth as glass. And the partnership looked so joyous. It looked like fun. Thought, wow, who was that? And I repositioned myself at another combination of fences. And this same horse rider pair came through. Again, just a thing of beauty. And I listened to hear the announcer to find out who it was. And it was Tick Maynard. Now, at this point, I should admit that I didn't know as much as I should about Tick because of my exodus from sport for those years in the energy field and raising my children. But I did know this. He was a Canadian, he came from Vancouver. He had grown up at Southlands Riding Club, which is a riding club basically right in the city now. It's been enveloped by Greater Vancouver. And I knew that he had done liberty work with horses as well. So I thought, wow, that is someone I would love to meet. Well, the universe does have a way of cooperating, doesn't it? <laughs> I returned uh, to the parking lot at the end of the day, and there were very few people left. Um, one gentleman was milling around, cooling out his horse, and he had a young child in tow, and uh, came up to say hello intrigued by the car and what was I doing and I shared a story of what I was in search of and where I was going and um, just had a beautiful conversation with a total stranger and I thought to myself as I was getting in the car wow this is it's such a great sport you know it's so rare that um, you find I think anywhere else and in the other riding disciplines too people that are so friendly you, you don't find them anywhere but in the eventing world <laughs> And um, I looked, and in a bucket to my right in the car was a bucket of Christian Lowe leather care products. Now, Christian Lowe is a good friend with a beautiful company and really nice products, and he had sent me with gifts for people that I stayed with, people that I interviewed, and I grabbed up an armload of uh, his samples and went over to the trailer where I saw this friendly man and his son and a horse hanging out in the sunshine and said, hey, just for being so friendly and amazing, here's a bunch of gifts you could probably use. And as he introduced himself, of course, it was Tick Maynard. So um, I told him that I was about to jump down a new rabbit hole for me. I was very interested in the Liberty work. And he said, hey, why don't you come by my farm? Well, I took him up on it. <laughs> I was planning to leave Florida the next day. And it was a big ask really a big offer for him to say, come by the farm and I'll show you a demonstration. Because I should mention that he and his wife not only run a big 
business as riders and trainers. His wife is Sinead Halpin, and she is one of the top three-day eventing riders in the world. And Sinead had just given birth two days previous to this competition. So fitting me in was a big ask, but I stuck around until he could. <laughs> and um, when I did get to go visit them at their farm, his mum Jennifer was there with Violet, the new baby, in a pram. And there was Sinead, less than a week after delivery, up on a horse's back, back in the saddle and riding again. They're pretty amazing. I had a beautiful demonstration. I got to watch him work the same horse that I had seen in competition. Beautiful big horse, almost black, dark, dark bay, and a lovely presence about him. I watched them have that same gorgeous connection as I saw out on course and do something that just looked like play. And with very little movement or body language or tools at liberty, he would get this horse to play and dance around a couple of barrels he had positioned and he shared some insight with me. So I'm forever thankful for that. He also agreed to do this interview for me, which I have to say he's fit in while driving to the airport to go, I think he's going to teach a clinic somewhere. So thank you very much for fitting me into what I know is a really busy life. And I'm going to hand it over now to our conversation, but I just want to tell you a little bit more about Tick. He grew up in Pony Club and got his Pony Club A. He has been a modern pentathlete and his story ended up being important to me on, on multiple levels because I'm trying to combine not just horsemanship, but what it takes to be resilient. And I hypothesize that the same things that make us really brilliant horse people is our ability to connect and that the same thing that allows us to connect allows us to be resilient, that all these things are connected. And didn't I find out that Tick Maynard has a beautiful story of resilience and of pivoting. So when I came home from this trip to Florida, I bought his book and read it. And, uh, and I, it's a terrific read. It's called In the Middle of the Horseman. And it tells a story about him having to face the end of his career as a modern pentathlete, a career where he had represented Canada. He'd been to, he'd been the national champion twice. He'd been to World Cups and World Championships and the 2007 Pan Am Games in Rio. And he found himself with a career ending injury and at the end of a breakup. So he um, turned lemons into lemonade. Sorry, I couldn't think of a better metaphor, but it works. And went on what he thought was going to be a one year learning journey to learn from the world's best horse people. And it ended up leading him down a three year journey of learning with all kinds of different horse people. And this is really rare in the horse world. Maybe it's becoming less rare, but there are so many different disciplines in the horse world. So many different ways to ride a horse. You can ride them English or Western. You can be a jumper, a dressage rider. You can ride Morgans. You can drive standard breads. You can race thoroughbreds. And so many of them are, are in their camp. You know, the, I'm an expert in my field and you should follow my methods. Now, I grew up as the daughter of a veterinarian, so I saw every ilk of horse person come through here, all declaring that their method was the way, but they were all getting results that they wanted with their horses. And so I was really intrigued at getting to know more about Tick, who went off to learn from jumpers, dressage riders, event riders, and Western horsemanship trainers, and it led him down the rabbit hole of liberty work. Um, so highly recommend that you look that up. And I'm going to stop talking to myself now, <laughs> or to you, and let us all listen to this conversation I had with Tick about how he pivoted and in his moment of despair and loss found something much better. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I know that this is an incredible incredibly busy time in life with you and, and your wife both being competitive and eventing and clinicking. That's right. We've got Brooks, our son, who's three and a half years old. And now we've got our daughter, uh, Violet Kathleen. We're going to call her Violet Kate. 
She's about six weeks old and Brooks just loves her, calls her goldfish. And he's always wants to help hold her or get her things or give her presents or brush her hair, or push the stroller. So it's pretty, it's, it's pretty fun. Since I met you at that event in Florida, uh, I've read your book and I really enjoyed it. And I wanted, yeah, yeah, beautiful story and a beautiful level of honesty. I wanted to share something. So looking at the intersection of resilience and connection and wanting to give people stories of others who have been challenged by life changes and trauma or whatever kind of shitstorm and who have pivoted and on the other side of it have some stories to tell. Now, you have a beautiful story of how the end of something can be the beginning of something bigger, or better, or deeper, or maybe more aligned, and something you hadn't maybe even imagined yet. And I wondered if you could tell us before you started on this adventure in learning and where you are now. Wow, that's kind of a, kind of a big question. I mean, one thing I really like that you said there that just struck a chord with me that is something I've been thinking about now again is this idea of, of the pivot, you know, pivoting. And Will Coleman and his wife, Katie Coleman, they just recommended a book to me called Green Lights by Matthew McConaughey. And I read that and Sinead just read that. And that's something that he talks about in his book as well is this idea of the pivot. And in the book that I wrote, I've got a quote in there from, I think it's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And the quote is something like, uh, to paraphrase, that the, the weaker person waits for decisions to be thrust upon him and, and then and sort of is forced to decide, whereas the stronger person will be proactive about making that decision, uh, about making that pivot. And when I was younger, I, I think I was always kind of waiting. You know, I was proactive with things once I chose to do them. But it's very hard to, to pivot and to find a new direction, a new purpose. At least I find it very difficult to, to change direction and find a new purpose. And I've done that a few times in my life and it's never been easy. And most of the time, there's been other things that have kind of pushed me along the way. Like when I've switched sports, when I've switched countries, uh, living in, you know, from living in Canada to living here. And I think now I'm at a point in my life where I feel another pivot coming up. And I'm trying to kind of have this idea in my mind that I want to be proactive about it and I want to not wait for it to happen to me, like not get so busy that I get overwhelmed and I get hurt, for example, that I'm forced to change, but to to do it first. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm, I'm very conscious of. And now that I've got two kids, it's really, and and all the responsibilities that go along with that, including financial responsibilities, it's kind of putting me in a position now where I'm thinking about what the, what the next thing is for me. Mm -hmm. If this is resonating with you and you've ever felt a little lost as you navigate conflicting data from horse pros across the disciplines, all claiming to have their own methods or recipes for making magic with horses, and you want the clarity and confidence to make sense of it all, I have a roadmap for you. Check out our foundation course. Consider it Horsecraft 101, from amateur to magician, making magic with horses. A unique group coaching program with live online support that helps adult amateurs from non-horsey families who are seeking understanding and connection become the best stewards for their horses in nine weeks without conflicting data, lack of knowledge, or not knowing where to go to for help. So they understand how and why horses think and react the way they do to create a relaxed and confident relationship. If you're still on the fence, we have a freebie for you. If you're ready, so are we. You can get started at themagicofhorsecraft.com. Until then, take a chance and remember, anything is possible. So in, uh, at the beginning of the story, in one of your turning point moments, you were injured yeah. and seeking out a learning adventure. And in the story... You managed to learn not just from one person for a year as a working student, but uh, quite a number of them. And was it over a period of three years in the end? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. About three years. Yeah. I was planning on going just for a year. To, you know, the whole process evolved and I, and I allowed it to evolve. I wasn't very, I wasn't super strict with my idea, but 
my original idea was one person for a year to be a working student. And then um, I actually read, you know, I was reading books about other people that were working students. And I, at that time, I also read Eat, Pray, Love by Elizabeth Gilbert. And she went to Bali, Italy, and somewhere else. She went to three different places. So then I had the idea that I was going to go be a working student for a year, but I do, um, you know, a third of the time with a show jumper and then with a dressage rider and then with a three day event rider. And it, the whole thing got, uh, I went to more than three people and I, it took place over three or four years. And I also probably the biggest, uh, curveball that life threw at me at that point was getting interested in the idea of, of horsemanship or what some people call natural horsemanship. And I went to Texas and worked with, uh, Bruce Logan, who's, who's sort of a cowboy and he does a lot of, of, uh, starting horses and problem horses. And he, he competes in the sport of cutting and I'd never really experienced any of those things before, you know, I, before that point, I'd never started a horse myself. You know, I grew up in Vancouver on the West coast of Canada and all the horses that I'd been experienced with were, were older horses, more mature horses, sort of already a little bit trained and uh, on small properties at something's riding club. And never, I never had this idea of going out, like what it would feel like to, to go out and have a horse that maybe doesn't want to be caught in a, in a 10 acre field. And you're trying to catch a horse in a 10 acre field. I mean, where I grew up, there wasn't even a property that was 10 acres, much less a whole field. I grew up as the local vets kid. And so there was every kind of horse person in here and all of them proclaiming that theirs was the way to ask a horse to do something, you know, their method, their way. I wonder how you pulled the common threads between all these different people and ways of working with horses and um, what some of the more important common threads are, do you think? Yeah, I love this question because I've always been wary of people that say like, my way is the best way or my way is the only way. And when you think about the, the horsemanship world, which is what I've really gotten interested in, you know, you had in the United States anyway, with Ray Hunt and with the Dorrance brothers, you had these guys sort of just, I don't know about inventing it or, but sort of going on the road with it and kind of popularizing it a little bit as sort of what you might call the grandfather's horsemanship in the United States and in North America. And then, and I think they were probably pretty humble, humble people and learning from different people. And then already the, the next generation, you had some really, some really big names, you know, you had Pat Pirelli, you had, um, Buck Brannaman, you had Monty Roberts, and these guys really have still to this day, like they have their their way of doing things, and it really doesn't branch out past that. And they're very good at what they do, but it, it's it's people get immersed into like doing it this Pirelli way or this Monty Roberts way or or or, or this Buck Brannaman way. And then I think right after that, this next generation and the generation after that, which I'm kind of a part of, you get people that are realizing that all these other people have something to offer. Um, and not only in these different styles of horsemanship, but also maybe learning from dog trainers, learning from clicker trainers, learning from sea mammal trainers, learning from circus trainers, learning from people that work with horses for movies and for stunts, people that are approaching it from maybe not even a riding background, but from the, from the background of, of observing horses, people that study animal behavior in general. And so we're sort of like incorporating all this into into a more holistic way of doing things. And I, what I really encourage everybody to do is not to try and do things just how I'm doing it, but find to find your own way of doing things. Because I think everybody, when you think about the relationship that you have with a horse, I think of it as there's a leader and a, and a follower, but more, you really want the emphasis to be on a partnership. And I think when you think about any partnership that you've had or, or any relationship that you've had, each one is a little bit unique. And I think everybody can, everybody should be allowed to feel like they have their own way that they can work with horses. Now, I'm not saying there aren't ways that are better, or ways that are worse and ways that are faster and ways that are slower. But I, I do think everybody can still have a unique way that is unique to them and their relationship with their horse. And I'm often surprised, you know, when I'll see somebody that maybe doesn't have that much experience or doesn't have the timing or isn't that athletic or didn't grow up with horses or whatever it is. And they just are really interested and they're really patient and they'll just develop such an amazing connection with their horse um, just through the persistence and the patience and, and the time they spend getting to know their horse. And that's the kind of stuff that really, really inspires me. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you were looking at different disciplines and different approaches, what would be the first quality you would want to see in a trainer, no matter what brand they were espousing? Wow, that's a, that's a good question. So all kinds of qualities I look for. And I would want to know who is asking in terms of how I would answer that. And I'm going to give you a few different answers, but I'm going to explain why I say that. I think there's some trainers out there, like people that I might go learn from that have different specialties. For example, like there might be somebody that's good with, with older horses or younger horses or problem horses. So there might be somebody that's good with, you know, even confident horses versus unconfident horses or somebody that's good with horses, but not with people. Um, mm. I think I'm at the point now and not every day, like there's some days I'm, I'm less confident than other days, but I'm at the point now, mostly with my confidence level that I can go in and I can take a lesson from somebody that I think has a good way with horses and is getting a lot done, but maybe isn't, isn't very good for my confidence or isn't very good or even with my particular horse, but I, I can protect my confidence and I can protect my horse. And I can just go in and take the parts of what they're offering that I like or that I need. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think a lot of people, if they throw themselves into that situation, they're going to lose confidence. They don't have the sort of the foundation where they're ready for it. So I think you really have to, you really have to think about what you and your horse need. Are you, do you need confidence? Do you need skill? Do you need experience? Do you need patience? And you look for somebody that is going to help you with that. You know, for me in particular, I'm a pretty goal oriented person. And one of the things that I probably struggle with the most, which I also think is one of the most important qualities in a horseman, is patience. And I'm very aware of it, and I try to be extra patient because of it. But I, I love like competing. I love getting things done. But I also recognize that the importance of doing things on a horse's timeline and of being patient. And so I, I always remind myself of that when I get in situations, or I'll talk about it with my wife, or I'll talk about it with my dad or my, or, or, you know, or who's ever important to me, you know, my mentor in that moment and say, you know, I think maybe I'm going too fast. I just need like a check here. Can you help me slow down? Um, mm -hmm. In terms of the big picture, just stuff that I love to see when I watch people train horses or I watch people compete is just um, people that have a joy about it. People that have, um, you know, people that can have a smile, people that can give their horse a pat, people that look relaxed, people that you think are not just doing it, um, you know, to win and are not just doing it for the, for the money. You know, I, 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 as I get older every year, I, I think I probably get a little closer to feeling like competition is less important and thinking of working with horses more as an art form than a sport. I mean, I'm still very invested in it as a sport right now, but every year I get closer to that point and I wouldn't be surprised, surprised if that progression in me continues to take place over the next 20 years, which I'm kind of curious to sit, to watch myself and see if that, how that develops. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Yeah. And I think that when um, we're trying to discern who to work with and where we want to be, that that common thread between joy between the horses and the riders. And um, I know in your, in your book, you talk about it often like dancing and dance partners, you know, that it feels like that. I love, I love that. I think it's a great comparison because if you think about a dance partnership, which is often, but not always between a man and a woman, um, the man often is leading and the woman is following, but she should be, she should in no way feel forced to follow like she's invested in it she wants to follow she's emotionally and, and intellectually invested in trying to be the best follower she can be and the the leader is is leading but he's really trying to show her off like look how beautiful and athletic my partner is my my horse is look how beautiful and athletic and smart they are look what they can do look look at their eye look how soft and focused it is look at their movement look how supple and relaxed they are mm. I'm just started Liberty work and um, really excited and invested in it. When I watched you do a demonstration for me at your farm in Florida, you put some music on and went in and connected with them. I wondered if a couple of things, if the music was important, one, and two, if there was 
sort of a state that you needed to show up in to do the liberty work that was beyond or different what you brought to the table when you were going to get on with all the equipment and ride. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe before I answer that question, do you mind, um, it, just, just tell me a little bit more about, you know, you've said you started down this rabbit hole of Liberty, maybe who else you've watched or listened to or, or learned from. And also maybe I wouldn't mind if you kind of shared a little bit about what you took away from that little session that, but I'm curious what your take was on, on that little session. And then I'll, I'm going to answer your question after that. So my rabbit hole of Liberty work is pretty shallow yet. Um, Mustang Maddie, um, mm -hmm. and a course. She's great. Yeah. I saw her, I saw her live at the Ocala Livestock Pavilion a few years ago, right before she kind of got a, a bit bigger name, I think, but yeah, she's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm currently looking for a horse to work with and want to partner yeah. with someone so that I can take uh, a 16 week course and follow along all the steps. And I thought that might be one of the easiest ways to get um, the training in without being at someone's farm. And there's the structure of doing exercises and reporting back. I love that. I love that. Yeah. When I was at your place um, and I watched you start the session, I noticed your focus and your energy of, hey, buddy, uh, this is me thinking <laughs> what a sense of, that I got from you to the horse, like, hey, buddy, this is, this is going to be fun. What do you want to do? Let's go play. It was a sense of play. There were very few big body language cues you could hardly see a movement but you would proceed through figure eights through the two barrels you had set up and he would run towards you and stop and change direction and he looked happy and invested and like hey boss what do you want me to do next oh yeah it'll be fun and i i just wonder that if you have to be somewhere kind of special in your head and in your mind and in being present, that you can maybe, um, you can get away with not being in there when we throw all the equipment on and ride. And I had some questions a bit about that in your head state when you showed up. Yeah, that's interesting that you said that about the equipment. You kind of said that you can get away. Is that what you said? You can get away with it. And I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. You know, I've seen people at horse shows you know, flatting the horses around, like at a jumper show, walk, truck, canter around, and they got their horse and draw reins and they're on their phone chatting with somebody, like they've got a Bluetooth thing up and they're having a conversation, a full on conversation about something completely unrelated to their horse. And I'm just thinking like how, watching that, like how can you expect a horse to give you when you're not giving them 100% focus? You're right. It's just very easy to get away with stuff when you can get away with stuff. Like when you've got, you know, you've got reins and you've got a bit and you've got draw reins or whatever it is. Um, because the horse isn't going to leave. Like you don't have to give them a hundred percent focus. Uh, but when you brought a horse at Liberty, if you're not, if your timing's not right and they don't feel that back and forth, that connection to you. Um, yeah, they're just gonna, they're just gonna leave. And the bigger that space you work in, the, the easier it is for, the, for them to leave. If, if you work in a very small round pen, they can't go very far, but it, you know, you watch some of these, see some of these Liberty trainers that have a great connection with their horse and they can go out in a 10 or 20 acre field and work with their horse at Liberty. Uh, and the horse is going to keep that, that connection, that kind of mental and heart connection to their, to their person. And that's just incredible to watch. Yeah. The first person that got me really inspired about, um, Liberty work is Jonathan Fields in British Columbia. And he just has such an amazing connection to some of his horses. And uh, he has a book called The Art of Liberty, and, and he does little tours across Canada, and, and you get to see some of his horses. And it's just incredible to watch. I do think that the very best, the very best riders, you know, bring that kind of focus, even when they could get away with it because they've got tack on and all this stuff. Like they bring it to their rides anyway. But I think, I think a lot of people don't. Like they they can get away with it, so they don't. And if I were to compare liberty work to something under saddle i would compare it to like when you see dressage being done beautifully and art artistically and with joy uh 
because the, the great Liberty trainers that I see, and I, I learn more about it every year myself, they have that attention to detail, <laughs> you know, like, is the horse straight? Is the horse in shoulder in? Is the horse in shoulder four? Is the head bent three inches or two inches? Are the haunches a little bit to the outside? Is the horse tracking up? Is the horse bent through the rib cage? Is the horse, you know, are the ears to the side and, and floppy? Are the ears pinned back? Is the horse in front of my leg? Uh, is there a smoothness? Is there a throughness? Uh, is my change of direction smooth? Do they kind of, you know, come a little bit uphill as they come out of the turn? You know, all these things. People that are great in dressage, I see it. People that are great in liberty training, they see that as well. And then you start to see, um, you know, I guess when I started liberty training, I, my entire focus was on the, uh, <clears throat> like the, the emotional side of things and the connection side of things, because that's what I got so interested and passionate about at the beginning. And when I was riding, it was the opposite. I, you know, you'd be interested in the physical. How does the horse move? How does the horse jump? And, and now I'm starting to realize more and more how important the emotional side is when you're riding, but also how important the physical can be when you're working with the horse at Liberty. If a horse is, you know, not comfortable in their body and you're asking them to work at Liberty, they're not going to be happy. They're not going to be as fluid and smooth. And so the, the further I get down the road, the more I think it is sort of a 50, 50 thing that we're, we are a physical therapist for this horse or a physical trainer for this horse, trying to get them to be athletic and supple, but we're also trying to develop this mental and emotional partnership with this horse where they feel relaxed and joyful. And it, it gets to be, you know, exactly 50, 50, I think. Mm -hmm. I have this hypothesis that what stands in the way of a lot of people who are new learners, say adult amateurs who have always wanted to take up the sport and they're coming after work to get their lessons and something is remaining mechanical between them and the horse and they aren't getting the feel or the connection they want being mindful and present in a way that the horses need us to be that is difficult with so much of our society today and, and the laundry list and to-do list going on in our head and the worries about how we look and uh, I wonder if liberty work would be a good way for people to connect with a horse maybe before or in supplement to their riding lessons. I 100% agree with you with, with everything. To go even, even further, I think there's a, a sense often people want to ride, that it's, it's somehow more valuable and more important or, you know, than something that you would do on the ground. And, and you know, you might see somebody that works it, but, you know, what about under saddle or when are you going to ride the horse or, or what can you do? But I, my advice to somebody is like, if all you want to do is work on the ground with your horse and you never ride your horse your entire life, like that's great too. You know, why, why does somebody have to decide that riding is more important than groundwork or groundwork is more important than grooming? Like find what makes you happy. You know, people go into, people tend to do, in my opinion, usually what they started out doing. If your introduction to horses was in the hunter jumper world, you usually end up being a hunter jumper rider. If the first barn you went to was a Western barn, you usually end up doing Western. Now, not everybody, but a lot of people sort of just kind of do what their barn is doing. Um, but experiment, like go take a Western lesson, go take a competitive trail riding lesson, go watch a polo game, go see what endurance riding a, it, it is about, or, or um, you know, these different competitive trail things, or, or go learn about, you know, and liberty isn't just one thing. There's, there's multiple, what I would call styles of liberty. Uh, you know, you have people that maybe come from a Pirelli background. You have people that come from a clicker training background. You have people coming from a circus training background or a sea mammal training background. And there's so many different things you can do with your horse. You don't want it to be mechanical. You want to find something where you can really enjoy the time you're spending with your horse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I found it interesting to learn recently about our energy fields and how they interact, about our emotional states. Less is known about whether or not they can actually grasp what we're thinking. And there are people who, even like Pat Burgess, who taught Lucinda Green and um, so many others, she would say to picture what you wanted and they will pick up on that. And there's, there's no way of knowing whether they can see the pictures that we send them in our heads, but there is some science behind what happens when we picture something before as we're doing it. 
I wondered if you used visualization when you're telling your horse to go around the barrels and doing this liberty work. Are you are you picturing it as well or sending them pictures or? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that I, I consciously sort of imagine what you would think of as like a like a little kid's drawing of a picture. But there's there's definitely a clarity and an intention when I ask the horse to do these liberty things, like go around the barrel and come back. Like I've got a very, a very clear picture in my mind of how I want to ask and how I want it to look and what I want the final result to be. And um, I guess I get a lot of those pictures by watching a lot of other people that are doing it in a way that I want to do it or that really inspire me. You know, Jonathan Guild is a great example, but there's, there's a lot of people out there that are very good at what they do. And you watch their body language, their intention. If you ever watch somebody work on the ground with their horse, or you're, let's say you took a 10 minute video of, of whoever, somebody, somebody leading the horse or working at Liberty with their horse or training a horse and just watch their body language. Is it, does it look smooth? Does it look joyful? Uh, can you tell what they're asking the horse to do? It, it should be very obvious. You know, if you were to watch, um, you know, a, a mime or somebody like Charlie Chaplin, like there's no words, but it, their whole body is a lot. And you feel like their body and their mind and their heart is all aligned the same way. Like we all want to do this. We all want to go there. We all want to rest. We all want to bring our energy up. All the parts of your body are, are synchronized. It's not just that your stick is saying one thing and the rest of your body is saying another thing or that <laughs> you're smiling with your mouth, but your seat is tense. You know, it's like, everything has the same feeling together yeah beautiful thank you for that i see here a quote that i took from your book what if my idea of getting along with a horse is only a fraction of what is possible in a partnership do you have a better idea of what getting along with a horse feels like now that you've done liberty work yeah i mean i think I think from when I wrote that book to now, I think I'm further along. But I, I, you know, when I talk to people that I admire and respect in the horse industry in pretty much any discipline, um, that feeling of knowing more and getting better and understanding a horse more continues for the rest of your life. There's just gets to be that feeling where, where I start to realize how much more there is to learn ahead of me. Like if I were to think of a bunch of stuff that I, that I wish I was better at, like I could make, I could make a very long list. And I, I don't know if there's one person out there who can do all of these, all of the things I want to do better than I would go take a lesson from, for example, but there's many people that I wish I could go and learn from them and make that part of my horsemanship better. Mm -hmm. So many things like I could spend, you know, another, uh, the rest of my life, 30 or 40 years trying to get better with horses and understand them on a, on a deeper level and be clearer and more confident and have them understand me better and developing a better relationship with them. It just really feels like a never project. And it really, uh, it's really humbling and it's very, it's very exciting. Really. It's, yeah, I, I find it really exciting. Like I'm, I'm always interested in watching videos about horsemanship or, or watching competitions or learning from people. You know, Shane and I both go take lessons every week and attend clinics that are in Ocala in the winter. We usually host a couple of clinics before Christmas and then three or four clinics after Christmas in January, February and March. We bring in people from around the world. And it's it's usually the best part of my winter when I can instead of competing and teaching, I can take two or three days, just watch somebody else at my farm that's come in that is excellent at what they do and just get to learn from them. Beautiful. With all these new avenues online, there are ways for us to get in our head the picture of what we want. You talked about how it was so important to be really clear about um, the result you were looking for and how you were going to use your body and that you get that by watching people that you admire and who work with a horse the way you hope to. So if we want to learn from you, are there ways online that we can get access to your learning and tools? Yeah. I've got two digital platforms that I'm a part of. One is called the Horseman's University, which is run by a friend of mine, Nick Rivera, out of Wisconsin. And the other one is called the Noel Florida Equestrian Masterclass. And that's run by a lady and her fantastic team. 
and she's based in British Columbia in Canada. And that's, they have a lot of different people on their equestrian masterclass show jumpers like Ian Miller and Krasinski, uh, hunter riders, uh, dressage riders, a, a lot of really good people on that program. Uh, I've also got some articles available online, uh, also on the Noel Floyd site, but also on other, a couple other websites. I write for the Off the Track Their Red magazine, which comes out quarterly. Uh, it's a print magazine only, so you have to order that by becoming a member of the Retired Resource Project. And then I do think uh, down the road, Sinead and I will will probably at some point in the next 10 years start our own digital platform. But it's the kind of thing that's very time consuming uh, to run it yourself. And I don't think we're at the place where that's our primary focus. Both of us are still really on a journey with competing and trying to make our national teams and stuff like that. So that, that's our primary focus right now. Beautiful. Well, thanks for sharing that. I'll be sure to put up in the links some ways that people can connect with you learning online or at your clinics. And I really encourage them to. It's a beautiful thing to watch you working with a horse and just um, to see the look in your eyes and the look in your horse's eyes of pure joy. And it was a beautiful thing to witness you going across country on that beautiful horse. Thank you. That's, yeah, that's oh, Galileo. Horse's that's Galileo, that's my dad's horse. He's a fantastic horse. And that's the same horse that we did the, the Liberty training with. It's a very special mm -hmm. horse. Yeah. If you don't mind uh, just adding one thing, I just in December recorded the book that I wrote um, that you said you just read. I recorded it with Helena Harris and took four days, it took 24 hours of, of reading, but it's, you know, that, there's a lot of editing after that point, but it actually comes out um, May 20th, which as we're recording this right now, it's, it's uh, May 19th. But, so when by the time people hear this, it'll already be out on audiobook and people will be able to to listen to the book as well as read it. For You know, I always know there's some people out there that prefer audiobooks to readings. Oh, well, good for you. Yeah, the book is called In the Middle Are the Horsemen. It is really enjoyable to dive into. You're as good or not better a writer than a horseman than that thing. It was a really beautiful read. Really Thank enjoyed you very it. Much. it. Brought us right in into it, you know? And uh, I'll leave you to it. I, I really appreciate this, Tick. Well, it's been uh, a pleasure to get to know you a little bit more. And I, I it was nice that you got to come visit our farm. I I look forward to meeting you again and hopefully seeing you in Ocala. You're always welcome to come back out to the farm again. Super. I'll be back. Thanks, Paige. Hey, you're still here. Thanks so much for listening. What you think and feel matters. If this resonated with you, please like and share. It truly makes a difference. I encourage you to engage with the content on my Substack account and my socials, all at The Magic of Horsecraft, where you can join the discussion and shape the future shows. Tell me what you want to hear more of or less of, and we'll evolve together as we grow a community of like-minded souls here for the good of the horse. If you're an adult amateur horse lover looking for confidence and clarity in your role of equine steward, check out my course, From Amateur to Magician, Making Magic with Horses at themagicofhorsecraft.com. Until then, I'm here to remind you of a couple things. One, underneath it all, we all want the same things, to be heard, understood, and accepted for who we are. And two, anything is possible. Take a chance. <laughs>